Good afternoon and welcome to Finding the Plot. My name is Sebastian Whittington Smythe and today we're looking at a game that needs no introduction. No. no, I'm not letting you do this, no! If you dare make Zelda look like Nazi propaganda, well I'm going to, um... Um... Well I haven't really thought that far ahead. I guess I'll just stare blankly at the camera until I have something to say. But why would Nintendo want to make Nazi propaganda? As ever Barry, you'll be enlightened. So sit back, relax and throw some jars as we find the plot of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Before we get directly into the game though, we need to turn our attention to the game's backstory. According to Hylian legend, the world was created by three gods. The god of power who created the land, the god of wisdom who created science and wizardry and brought order to nature, and finally the god of courage who created life and brought justice and vigour to the world. After they made the world, they created the Triforce, a golden triangle that contained a small amount of their power. This Triforce was hidden in the Golden Land, safe from the hands of regular mortals. Legend has it that it beckoned to people with the hope that a worthy champion would find it. One of the races created by these gods were the Hylians, pointy-eared folk who possessed magic-infused blood and psychic powers. They were skilled in wizardry and their ears allowed them to hear special messages from the gods. They were held in high regard and settled around the worlds, teaching the lesser folk by sharing their knowledge and lore. Do you notice something about this backstory? So let me guess, you're going to say that the Hylian race is like some sort of master race, you know, like the Nazis had with the Aryan race. Exactly, I'm glad you got the connection. What about the rest of it? I'm only doing this because I know you're going along a Nazi theme. As the rest of it, not a friggin' clue. <sighs> the religious history of the gods recalls somewhat pagan beliefs. The Nazis had a belief of blood and soil, which is considered by some observers to be a kind of neo-paganism. It's clear that the Hylians, like the Nazis, considered them to be some sort of master race. They not only believed themselves to be better, but also looked to teach the lowly folk about paganism, to be in tune with nature. They saw the Triforce as a kind of beacon of knowledge, a symbol of natural harmony, three virtues in balance. Anyway, as time passed, people began to write legends about the Triforce, claiming that it would make the bearer's wishes come true. This encouraged the greedy to chase after it, leading to a long-running bloody war until it was found by Ganondorf Dragmire, the King of Thieves, better known as Ganon. His greed and evil contaminated the Golden Land, and long story short, seven wise men were summoned to seal the entrance to the Golden Land. The good people of Hyrule forged the Master Sword, a sword designed to defeat evil should it ever rear its ugly head. More on that later. The backstory mentions that the Triforce, an inanimate object, cannot tell good from evil, but is able to grant people's wishes. So, what we can surmise is that over time, those with an unjust worldview sought the Golden Land. They wanted to obtain this big gold inanimate object that could grant their greatest wishes. This greed contaminated the Golden Land and nearly contaminated Hyrule. But it was sealed away just in time. Any thoughts, Barry? Right, so these Hylians are Nazis, Germans, whatever. But surely you're not going to say that the thieves of this game are the Jews? Yes. Yes, I am. The Nazis believed that the Jews were a corrupting influence who encouraged immorality. Greed is certainly immoral, and the stereotype of money-hungry Jew is embodied quite well in a group of people pursuing a golden artefact. Indeed, money, like the Triforce, doesn't know right from wrong, but it can grant many wishes. Some Nazis believed that the Jews wanted to achieve world domination, and by showing them as a corrupting influence, ruining this golden land, and perverting their pagan beliefs of the Triforce as they go, is quite strong symbolism. After this, a mysterious wizard called Eganhim appeared. He eliminated the king and kidnapped seven maidens, including the king's daughter, Princess Zelda. And that's where the game begins. So naturally, we start by inputting our character's name. Seb. Not Adolf. This is to give the player a sense of being Link, part of the Hitler Youth. Why would Adolf need to be indoctrinated? So we hear that Zelda is a prisoner in the castle and needs help. It's actually Link's uncle who hears this psychic message and goes off to save her, but we'll see what happens to him. After a while, Link gets up and decides to go to where his uncle went. As you can see, Link is the embodiment of the Master Race with his... Purple hair? I don't recall Nazis having a thing about purple hair and black eyes. He's got the pointy ears. There are debates about why Link's hair is purple in this game, but we clearly see in later games with better colour palette that it is blonde. In this game, however, we have established that pointy ears are a trait of the Master Race, and Link's got those in abundance. It was all clever writing to erase the doubt, see? And we also see that Link's famous hero costume is actually his pyjamas. So off Link goes and finds his uncle dying. He gives Link the job of saving Zelda, and Link does a nice Nazi salute with his sword. Oh god, really? Really? Not to mention that he's doing it with his left hand. Link cannot salute with his right hand because he's holding the shield there. Now, why the conscious choice for Link to hold them like this? Because Link, defender of the Nazi purity, is defending the right hand side. The political right, see? It's all subtle touches that hammer home the message. Link gets to Zelda's cell and frees her. 
Notice how Zelda asks him to push from the left to open a bookcase, showing another subliminal message that those on the left need to be on the right. The Nazis didn't like communists, after all. Or she's advocating communism by pushing from the left. If you're not going to take this seriously, I'm not even going to bother. No, please, do carry on. It's just so hilarious. They pull the handle on the right to open the door into the sanctuary where they learn that Taganin was trying to use Zelda to open the seal to the Dark World. Doing so will spread evil throughout the land. She then tells Link to go and murder a Ganon, which to be fair is pretty Nazi. Well, yeah, it is. I'll give you that. And the only thing strong enough to beat a Ganon and his puppet master is the Master Sword. The Sword of the Master Race is Hyrule's final solution. Do you think we're going to offend anyone by this? Well, I'm just saying, you know, some people take the Holocaust seriously. And Zelda fanboys, well, you know, they take it quite seriously as well. You know, if you manage to piss off the Jewish Ninty fans, there's going to be chutzpah everywhere. Moving on. To be deemed worthy to wield the sword, Link must pass some trials. He must overcome three dungeons and obtain the Pendants of Virtue. In the first dungeon, he obtains the bow and the Pendant of Courage. In the Desert Palace, he obtains the Power Glove. I love the power glove. It's so bad. And after killing some sandworms, he obtains the Pendant of Power. On his way to the third, Link must head to Death Mountain. He encounters an old man who he guides to safety and who gives him a magic mirror as thanks. The mirror is said to pull him from the Dark World. The symbolism here is that if you ever drift off the path of purity, look to yourself for guidance. So, to actually reach the dungeon, he must be transported to the Dark World. Here he is turned into a bunny, and we find that, according to these two, the Dark World turns you into whatever's in your heart. Link, the Nazi, turns into a fluffy bunny, something we can all relate to. The others who came to the Dark World for greed are shown to be filthy monster Jews that they are. Taking this review out of context makes you sound a bit... Mel Gibson, you know. Awesome, I loved Mad Max. So, Link heads to the dungeon and defeats the snake thing, gets dependent of wisdom and also the moon pearl which helps him retain his form in the dark world. The pearl, being a sphere, represents the well-rounded individual who keeps his head under pressure, like all Nazis. As a worthy hero, Link marches off to the Lost Woods. Here he comes across a grove filled with animals, which is a visual representation of his pagan roots. This is where he finds the Master Sword, the blade that will allow him to carve out a path of purity and justice on the unclean. Just as he does that, soldiers find Zelda and kidnap her and kill the priest. Link runs to Zelda's rescue, but it's too late. Aganim does his magic and Zelda is gone. Link is so angry that he slashes the curtains and then charges in after Aganim. He kicks Aganim's butt, deflecting his magic back at him with the Master Sword, but Aganim escapes, sending both Link and himself to the Dark World. It turns out that the Seven Maidens are sealed away in seven dungeons. Why seven? Well, as it happens, Judaism has a thing about the number seven. The Shabbat is on the seventh day of the week. There are seven weeks in the counting of the Omer before Shavuot. In Israel, there are seven days of Passover and Sukkot. When a close relative dies, we sit at Shiva for seven days. Moses was born and died on the same day, the seventh of Adar. In addition to the 613 commandments, the sages added seven more. See, once again, the symbolism makes sense. So, Link is in the Dark World. Now remember that the Dark World used to be the Golden Land until the Jews got there. This is a possible sign of Nintendo's prejudice, that they fear that if the Jews ever make it to the Promised Land, they will corrupt it and possibly bring a new Dark Age. Wait, we're talking about Nazis here. How did Nintendo get into this? Well, you don't think that this game was made by the Germans, did you? Clearly somebody working at Ninty has a deep-seated anti-Semitism. Hell, Germans and the Japanese were allies in World War II. Anyway, unlike in Hyrule, where there are lots of friendly people to talk to, very, very few here will help Link or talk to him without trying to rinse him for money. This has been bugging me. I'm pretty sure my parole officer read to me that some Nazis didn't like Jews because they might be communists, among other things. They sound like capitalists to me. That couldn't be more the polar opposite unless this was a game about childhood abstinence made by Gary Glitter. Do bear in mind, Barry, that this game was made in 1992. Stereotypes had moved on. The stereotype of the money-hungry entrepreneurial Jew is even more in vogue these days. This is why everybody who you speak to in the Dark World runs a small business geared at robbing poor Link. They're targeting him specifically. You can see this because he's the only guy in the world with a glass bottle, and so many people sell potions that can't be carried any other way. The idea is to make the player feel ill at ease with these people, and the poorly timed capitalism is just a thing to draw comparisons with the Jews. It's using a mixture of modern and old-fashioned Jewish tropes to put across how dangerous the Jews are in the eyes of the Nazis, of course. Seb, all this... It's only in your head. 
I can't help it if I can spot the subtleties. Others are just being subliminally influenced. The only nice people you can talk to are the trees, because of Link's hardcore paganism. There's also a couple of guys in caves early on, and this fat fairy, and while the fairies in the light world are at the peak of the physical ideal, this one is bloated by Ganon's evil Jewishness, but more on her later. Another thing worthy of note is how everybody in the Dark World is primitive and are certainly a level below Link in terms of evolution. While he travels the seven dungeons picking up tools and being industrious and clever, this primitive lot throws spears, bombs or wields deadly q-tips. This is yet another sign of his genetic superiority. So he trundles through the seven dungeons and in each one he battles the monsters who are guarding the maidens. Each one is trapped inside a valuable crystal and they keep it in the ceiling and, phew, lucky Link caught that. When he frees them they tell him a little bit about the story. The first tells Link how Ganon found the Triforce in which to rule the land, and that he is planning on invading the Light World once he's built up his power in the Dark World. He intends to use the Maidens to open a gate into the Light World near the castle. If all seven Maidens are rescued, they can break the barrier around Ganon's fortress, and Link can go and kill him like a good Nazi. The second says that Ganon found the Triforce but couldn't find a way back, however because Link has magical powers that only the hero can make the most of, he can go between one and the other. Once again, this is because of his superior bloodline. The third talks about the Great Cataclysm, that if someone with an evil heart gets the Triforce, then the hero is destined to sharpen and stop him. Only someone with the Knight's blood can be the hero, and it just so happens Link is the one with the uber blood. He is pure, he is the hero, and he must rescue Zelda. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Zelda a Yiddish name? And so doesn't that make her at least a little bit Jewish? I'm glad you brought this up. Yes, Zelda is a Yiddish name, and the Yiddish is High German. With Zelda being a pure Nazi princess with a high German Yiddish name, it represents the blurring of society from the purity of Nazism to the terror of the Jews. Like I said, the Nazis worried that the Jews would corrupt their society. What corruption could be worse than this pure Nazi princess being used by this uber-Jew to open the floodgates and allow his evil into the world? That's why it is her legend, and why she is the one who matters most of all. She is both sides of the coin, do you see? Well, not really. Let's just get this over with. The next maiden talks about the Knights of Hyrule, the Nazis to you and I. She says that whilst the wise men were sealing the Dark World away, the Knights of Hyrule were defending them from the monsters, but they were all nearly wiped out. This draws a parallel to World War II. Imagine from a Nazi point of view that by committing the Holocaust they were sealing away the evil, but the Allies were trying to stop them and in doing so wiped out most of the Nazis. Link is the last one left. She says, it is ironic that the last one in line has the potential to be the hero of legend. This statement empowers the player. He can do it. He can continue the Brave Knight's legend. The next two simply reiterate about what Ganon was using them for, and the importance of the bloodline. Link heads to Turtle Rock to rescue Zelda, the final maiden. She confirms that Link is a legendary hero and Ganon's plan has nearly come to fruition. It's time to stop Ganon! I've been waiting for you to mention the flu kid, but you're not going to, are you? He's not that important. Oh, well. You can't find a way to fit him into the narrative, can you? <sighs> if you must. Okay, in the light world there is a boy playing a flute in the grove. Animals sit with him and he is clearly in tune with nature. But when you go near him he vanishes. It's a sad sight indeed. In the dark world, in the same spot, we find a dying, twisted creature who says that he used to play the flute for the animals, but now he's stuck here. He asks if you can find the flute for him. When you return to him, he says he's too weak to play it, so you play it for him and he dies, turning into a tree. He represents the potential for redemption. He was a pagan, in tune of nature and pure of heart, but something corrupted him. Perhaps his parents forced him to be a Jew, we don't know. All we know is that he has been corrupted by Jewishness. However, when he died, he returned to nature, becoming a tree. It's one of the saddest moments in the game and shows the sad truth that even the good can be corrupted, but also that there is a chance for redemption. Perhaps you can redeem the rest of the world, one dead Jew at a time. Oh, before I forget, just before entering Ganon's tower, you can use the giant bomb to break into a fairy pool. If you throw your bow in, you obtain the silver arrows, which are Ganon's weakness. Why his weakness? Because it's not gold. Jews love gold, not silver. It's bringing down his net worth or something. There's not much to say about Ganon's tower. Link fights his way through the game's largest dungeon and... Get over here! Get over here! Get over here! Really? This is the closest you'll ever get to doing Mortal Kombat. Give me this one. Okay, I guess. Get over here! Okay, I'm done. Eventually, you get back to a Ganon and kill him once and for all. It turns out that he was merely a puppet to Ganon's powers. Ganon flies away, however, and so all that remains is the final showdown. Here we see Ganon, and he's a pig. You may not know this, but to call a Jewish person a pig is a terrible insult, so it's clear that Ninty not only decided to make Ganon Jewish, but to show his true nature as a pig is to insult him fully. 
We kill him with the degrading power of silver and then go and rescue the Triforce, returning goodness to the world. And here we see all the good that we achieved. So the King Fuhrer came back, the Sage came back to life, Sazrala came back, Vultures ruled the desert. Really? Link cared that much about the Vultures? The bully makes a friend. Oh, even Link's uncle comes back. Zora opens a flipper shop. Witch and assistant. What happened to them? Twin lumberjacks. Okay. Flute boy came back. Awesome. Venus, queen of the fairies. Dwarven swordsmiths. This isn't what happened now. It's just a list of people and things. The Triforce gives you the power to make lists. It's just showing that everything is back to normal and good. Yeah, like the lost man is still on top of the mountain. Awesome. I'm sure he's dead now. Well, I think it's good. Anyway, the point of A Link to the Past, as you see, is to put over the anti-Semitic message. There's symbolism in there that's clearly intended to parallel the Jews and Nazi ideology, and I for one am shocked and amazed that it got past the ever-vigilant Nintendo of America censors. Nintendo clearly has an anti-Jewish agenda. But now we know about it, we cannot be manipulated. Hell, now I know about it, I'm going to release my Jewish captives. But my dear viewers, I think you should do the same. It turns out the Jews aren't so bad, it was just Nintendo brainwashing us. The Nazi way isn't the way forward, despite what we've been taught through these games. Together, we can make a difference. Or perhaps I've been talking bollocks this whole time. Yes, Seb. Maybe you have. Maybe you have!